Amazing. Well, thank you so much. So the way today will run, so we'll, I'll start with a really short presentation, then Maureen and I have a bit of a Q&A and go into more in-depth topics and points. So yeah, so lovely to be here. Um, it's a really amazing project, of course, that um, you guys are part of. So I'm really um, touched that you'd like me to come and talk. So yeah, um, just to kind of cover that again, yeah, I'm Cameron. I am a film producer and music producer, and I run like, my own business in Glasgow doing those kind of things for a variety of different clients, mainly charities um, and small businesses and things. Um, I in, in the midst of where we are now, COP is relevant because my background is sustainability. I also work part time in the sustainability sector, um, doing kind of sustainability consulting for the university. Um, so most of my work comes around telling stories of sustainability and climate change. So right now in the midst of COP26, this is a very busy period. So this is very nice to kind of come and have a conversation, to have a bit of a breather. So yeah, it's an exciting. I'm sure you've all felt that kind of being in and around Glasgow. So yeah, um, I want to just give a bit of background to the work that I do. Hopefully if it's of interest, um, you know, I, I'm just going to share my screen um, to do a wee presentation with you just now. Here we go. So hopefully you can see that. Okay. Um, so yes, um, Maureen, can I please have a thumbs up if this is coming through? Um, all right. Yes, cool. Great. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm a kind of filmmaker and composer, and that's what I do. Um, right now, there's loads of different um, projects and things that uh, I've been involved in, um, especially over COP. So COP's been a huge thing, but that's not really where I started. I started out, um, I think, about 2012 doing this kind of work, so almost 10 years ago now. Um, and this was through a much more much less carbon friendly thing of doing expeditions. So when I was at university, I kind of joined and planned lots of different research expeditions to try and communicate climate change around the world. Um, and then I kind of produced films on that. In fact, my camera, I got my first camera because I was doing a kind of training walk for one of the expeditions across the north coast of Scotland, which is like Mackay country. And my surname is Mackay anyway. So the Mackay Clan Society gave me some money for my first camera if I made a film about that region of Scotland, which is what I did. It wasn't very good. Um, because it was the first thing I did. So that's where it began. Um, and then it led me to lots of these places. Now, this was really cool, but then thinking about um, climate change and kind of whose story is being told, like, look at communities like this. The last thing these communities need is some Scottish 18 year olds going out and being like, let me tell your story. So there was lots of legacies of kind of like representation and, 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 and carbon emissions there. So I thought, well, I should turn my attention back to Scotland, which is what I did, um, which has led me now to produce a lot of work around climate change, Scottish culture, Gaelic culture, um, and work for a lot of organizations in Scotland. Um, and that's also led me to do things with both myself as a business, things like BBC The Social, um, working in, in front of and behind the camera for various different things. But I think the really exciting thing about being in Scotland is that we have an amazing wealth of creativity, culture, and heritage to draw on to communicate climate change and connect people to the natural world through arts. Now, within climate change, I am really passionate about this. I think creative work matters so much when it comes to communicating climate change and connecting more people with um, stories around climate change, because I think we've seen a lot of stuff about the science now, but to really connect people, I think we've got to make people feel about climate change. You know, it's not just about thinking, but it's about feeling to kind of create that change. You know, I think that with climate change, We've got to hit people deep in their core and for yourselves think about the last time you were hit like so deeply by a piece of work or a tv show or something for me it's music and i always think you know like listening to an adele song it just hits you right you're thinking about this really deep stuff so i always think how can we create these adele level moments of engagement for climate change which is why i've kind of come to bringing music and film together drawing on the creative side of um scottish culture to bring this kind of really scottish sounding music into films around climate change um, which has led us to do a lot of really cool work. And I, I think that that's the really exciting thing we have in Scotland. We have this amazing, really emotive work right at our fingertips from the cultural music that we have to the storytelling to our kind of humor within our culture. So uh, that makes me really excited about the potential that we have to communicate climate change. Um, and I think when you bring that together, you, you bring a really kind of like personal element and you create positive, practical stories. And that really connects with people, maybe more so than this kind of heavy going news which we need you know people need represented and people who are going through with climate change need their story told but alongside that i think this kind of really uplifting cultural thing is really cool now going into more of a um skills careers focused perspective i want to talk a bit about that so i think sustainability and media skills go together so so well and we need the sustainability sector needs media skills we don't have it in the sustainability sector 
we are, need to communicate more. And comms is more than just a kind of an ability to greenwash and to say how well we're doing. It's, in a, it's opening a dialogue. And I think that people ha have these media skill sets in here, like staging interviews in the city and capturing video and sound, for example, um, is so crucial to the environmental sector because there is so much that we need to communicate and talk about, but not just tell one story. It's um, all about um, bringing people together and connecting lots of different people. So um, we definitely need to, I think, embrace those skills. And for people who have that kind of skill set, I think that's a really exciting opportunity to connect with those, those things because that is definitely what's going to lead us forward. So it's not just, you know, the, the, the filmmaking skills, it's music, it's media, it's journalism, all these different skills I think are so valuable. And there is a niche just now in the sector for them because that's what we need. But I think bringing those skills together, it's also about increasing representation. Right now, I think we're guilty in the sector and in media for having a slightly biased demographic towards maybe it's male oriented, maybe it's white people oriented. I say that with a lot of hypocrisy because I fit both of those demographics. But I think the more of these skill sets that we can embrace, the more diverse we can find the stories that we're telling and the better overall communications that we can have. So I think there's a lot to be said about supporting these kind of skill sets, which is exactly what obviously you guys are doing. So that's it. Um, and then finally, um, I don't know if this is kind of covering ground, that you know, or, or anything new. So I want to talk a little bit about the way I work in the creative industries. Everyone's way of working will be different. But I just thought, you know, we need the hard um, the agility of this all. It's easy to think about the non financial sides, but I think it's only fair to talk about the financials of it. So um, there's a lot of different ways to kind of make money, I think, in doing this. And what I find really interesting is, yeah, you working for clients, you know, um, it, it, it's a big way to do it. But there's so many ways within that. So from my perspective, it's working for clients, it's pitching ideas and getting them commissioned and funded, and it's submitting treatments to broadcasting companies and get them commissioned that way. So you can get independent commissions or broadcasting commissions. But there is also another way of passive income, which, you know, doing film and music, you create a lot of... Um, music, stock music and stock footage. And then when you can sell that to other filmmakers to use, that's a great way to bring money in um, passively without really thinking about every single sale that can support you. Um, and then it's obviously doing work like these, we kind of uh, alongside these smaller pieces for things that we see the social as well. Um, so that's it. There's a lot of different ways to make money in, in the industry. And I think that needs to be talked about more because it's easy to talk about all the, the good parts, all the fun stuff, but if we don't talk about money, we're not really making it as accessible as it should be. So hopefully that's a small insight um, into one way of doing it. But there's a lot of different um, yeah, ways to do it. There's no wrong way. I feel like everyone I know in the industry has a different um, setup. You know, maybe you work for a production company, maybe you work independently. So yeah, it's a really exciting industry to be part of. And I think positioned in the right way, um, telling stories in new ways and really rethinking how we communicate climate change there's a lot that we can do in the environmental sector that can support climate change and bring people together to, to bring new voices to the table and to connect different types of media and skill sets. Because, you know, when you can bring music and film together, it really does something that's greater, I think, than the sum of, um, of its parts. So, uh, yeah, right now I want to show you a little clip of um, something I just thought I'll show as opposed to tell. Um, I want to show you the opening part of a documentary, which is this. I don't know why it's gone off the full screen, but you can, you know, here we go. Um, this is a documentary I made recently for an organization called Lost Woods. Um, essentially, they had this wild idea to give every single primary school child in Glasgow an acorn to grow into their own tree. So everyone grew these um, seeds at home and then came to the Glasgow Children's Woodland, which is this amazing plot of land in Cathkin Brae's way the south side of the city. And they have created this amazing woodland that is every single primary school in Glasgow sent a delegation, I think all but five of, so 151, I think, of primary schools in Glasgow sent a delegation, their peoples and planted their trees. This super cool project to be part of, um, probably one of the most impactful things I feel like I've done. A lot of it is quite, um, not corporate, and I love every, all every project I've done. I'm lucky to be able to say that, but like this is all of them. It's quite grassroots, and of all the stories I've told, this seems possibly one of the most interesting. So, um, if you will have me, I'm just going to very briefly share the intro 40 seconds or so of this film, just to give you an idea of the kind of um, the kind of work that I do, and hopefully illustrate um, what it is. So here we go. I think planting trees is really important because they produce oxygen. Spending time in nature makes me feel calm because you can see like all of the flowers and all of the animals and 
Five inches is just fun. Came down here, we got our spades out, we put some saplings in the ground, and it was just wonderful. The kids were so enthusiastic, and the weather didn't put them off. I'm soaked, but they don't mind. <laughs> I'm going to tell you the story of the Glasgow Children's Woodland. Anyway. Oh, we're still going. Here we go. So yeah, hopefully that's just a very brief kind of introduction the start of the film, you know, but it illustrates hopefully the kind of work that I do bringing original music and film together. Um, that was such a cool project. Um, the filming with the kids of the schools were amazing. They were so charismatic, so it made my job easy. But that was also very technically interesting because you're filming, and as I'm sure, for those who do kind of film production here, as you will know, um, filming outside, um, I wasn't using lapels, it was all kind of boom mics and stuff, just independently in the rain. And then you've got like the minister from the government now, you're trying to make it look, you know, coherent. So definitely a challenge. I'm sure some of you would be able to give me some tips on how I could have approached that better. But yeah, I'll stop talking now. Hopefully that gives you a bit of background to what I do. Um, so yeah, but I'm happy to kind of open the discussion now and take things a bit further. Wow, Cameron, that's amazing. Well, <laughs> like, how much can you pack in seven, uh, ten minutes? <laughs> Thank you so much. That's so rich. And I have um, a few questions. If you guys want to think about questions that you have for Cameron as well, as soon as I'm done with my questions, I'll open it back to, on, to, to you guys. Um, I think it's so interesting. You have so many different facets of what you're talking about that are all very relevant. And that's something that I love about what we do here with like this Tuesday morning guest speaker program is that Really, at the college, we teach you like the um, like the technical skills, and like you know, we we try to um, help you embrace the industry. But really, the path that you're about to take will really be determined by your interests and by you know. And you, what I love about the creative industry, just as you mentioned, Cameron, is that you can mix the two. And you know, it's not a nine to five job where you know you kind of come out of your job and you go, oh, that was a horrible <laughs> thing. Do you know what I mean? Like you get to inform. What it is that you do, um, and everything that you covered uh, with, like from making money to you know being Scottish and all of that. So, okay, I'll come back to that. And that's something that I sometimes ask um, here because I think it's important uh, that like that awareness of identity. So you talk about Scotland and about you know as you say you have the storytelling element, you have the music element. I mean, really, what's left for the rest of the world? But, <laughs> Um, how important is that for you and how, um, I guess, what is it for you that makes a piece of work Scottish? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I don't know. I think, I mean, I think for the lot of work, and this is what I realised, because as obviously I said at the start, a lot of the stuff I did was going overseas to do things, which is, you know, I, I, I suppose was guilty of being young and just chasing these really exciting projects. But then looking back, I was like, you know, I was going to places like the Himalaya and then trying to create a film with those people that voiced narrated by you know white Scottish people and I was like what are we doing like that's so wrong. like not wrong because but like I just felt kind of didn't sit right I think when I looked back on it um but I made me think well I should talk about what I want to talk about nobody wants to hear that kind of you know we've got a, a really long way with this kind of like single like David Attenborough-esque narrative over things which is great but what excites me is kind of what I love listening to is people really telling their own story. And I realized that's probably not what I was doing. And the fact that there was everything a huge amount of carbon in the process was probably another reason to, to, to stop what that kind of thing. So yeah, it, it made me think about what's Scottish. And I don't know, I think for everyone in Scotland, it's different. What I love about working in the kind of storytelling part of Scotland is that everyone's got a different take on that. And I don't think there is one homogenous answer that, that Nicola Sturgeon will be, you know, putting out. I think it's a very um, diverse set of answers. And I think, you know, every, however many people are in Scotland, there's that many different answers. But to me, I love connecting with like the traditional culture because I think there's this amazing gem in, I say traditional, but it's evolving. It's part of our current culture, but it's, you know, so take the word traditional with a pinch of salt, but it's, you know, maybe it comes from, you know, Scottish kind of music, Cayley culture, the storytelling, the ballads, the folklore, all these different things. But the more I engage with that, the more I realize that's deeply connected to the natural world. Now, when you take those elements into storytelling, that suddenly connects you to nature in a way, you know, most traditional pieces of music are written about nature and a lot of slow airs, for example, the sl slower like fiddle tunes you get are Gaelic songs or the melodies of Gaelic songs. And then when you look at the, the, um, 
the words, the translations of those Gaelic words, they're all deeply, or not even the translations, you look at the Gaelic words themselves, the meaning is deeply rooted in the natural world. So for me, like communicating climate change, I feel like I've just found myself in this perfect kind of palette of, of different things. But I think, yeah, Scottish stuff, it's, I, I don't know, it's a difficult one. Um, I, I think it's important that we can tell a story and because, you know, that's what BBC The Social say, that they, they were like, we set ourselves, well, they said they set ourselves up they set themselves up to give a vote a place for Scottish accents to be unfiltered because mm. you know I've got quite a I suppose I, I come from the east coast in Fife northeast Fife so my accent's probably not as as uh, it's not as the best Scottish accent I must say I prefer the Glasgow accent it's amazing here but that was a platform to do that so yeah I I, I don't think I can answer that question eloquently but hopefully that's a couple no, of places I go did. to Thank you, you did, and that's very articulate. And I think what's really interesting is that through, you know, the array of speakers that we're showcasing on um, on this platform, I love that we can identify some trends. And um, a couple of weeks ago, we had um, Jodie Wilkinson from the Glasgow Film Theatre. And, you know, they have a big campaign about um, representation, diversity, inclusion, uh, like inclusivity. And she was talking about, they had a, an, ethos, I guess, a motto, which is um, nothing about us without us. And that really echoes what you're saying. And I feel like there's this sort of ethical approach that hopefully is sort of coming to the foreground that probably hopefully was around before. But, you know, that's really coming to the, um, to the forefront of like, there's a real awareness about going to another culture and lending your voice to that culture rather than, you know, yeah. platforming that culture. And I love that, you know, that's what well, you felt. Do you know, that was, I think, the first mistake that I made was not and I, I feel bad now looking, but I don't feel bad. I'm glad that things went the way they did, but I do feel this weird, like this discontent with previous things from like, I didn't get that at the start. And I think it's, you know, it's, you've got to be aware of that. And I think, yeah, I, I got that wrong before, I think. Um, but now I, I think it's important, but the funny thing was, I thought, right, I'll come look at Scotland. And then I traced kind of my kind of roots back into the culture that I'd connected to and found myself in kind of Gaelic speaking communities. And then I realized that it was the exact same thing. I was someone going into the community. Yeah, I had a lot more links to it, like both kind of through my own, you know, history and my own kind of place in the world. But I, I still encountered that same thing of like, is this really my story to tell, you know, working in places like um, North US and South US, which I've done recently, I do kind of ask that question who's, and, and make sure that there's the right people in the right places of the production because, but it's funny. So yeah, it, and I think for me, that's led me to a certain things now that I'm trying to explore more that are much more authentically me, but it's, I think it's a journey that everyone kind of goes on and figures things out. Absolutely. And I think once you make a mistake about something, um, like you become in a way, it was probably meant to happen because then you become an advocate for that particular thing and then do you know what I mean like that's how I see it this is why there's no mistakes like it's all yeah I've learned my lesson I won't do that again yeah <laughs> um so you were talking about making sure that people were in the right place in the production that's another question I had for you is um do you so like what does a camera make a production look like is it are you a self shooter like do you see the production through do you work with the team does it depend on the budget or you know the, the project what how how do you approach that? Um, it's very kind of self-shooting. So I will do kind of video, <clears throat> excuse me, video and sound myself. Um, but then I'll be, you know, I feel like being a self-shooter, so much of the production comes from the, the organization or the group I'm working with, from the script to the story, to a lot of that kind of guidance over the way the story is told. So seeing I'm a self-shooter, it would be, you know, it, it is true and technically that's what I fall into, but I do outsource and subcontract a lot as well. So some parts of the music I'll kind of um, outsource because I love certain elements of it, which I cannot do myself. Um, and also drone footage. Um, I got right, a drone right before lockdown and got trained on it, but I that lockdown kind of killed that and I'm not that good. But there's a drone um, filmmaker, Paul Kai, that is one of the most incredible drone pilots I've seen work of. Um, and it makes, even if I kind of do progress in my own drone work I still want to keep going to them because they're fantastic so if you ever need any drone footage Hawkeye at Hawkeye Scotland, Hawkeye Scotland um they've been amazing to me over the last um few months and yes yeah, so I love working with them so I do kind of try and because it's collaborative it's just I don't want to sit in a room and do stuff on my own because that doesn't really matter I don't think I like that kind of collaborative feeling but yeah my own work it does it is probably a lot of my own kind of headspace on which is a huge risk I think um it, I like it because I think clients like that being able to bring a lot out in a small with as few people as possible bringing a lot to the table which is nice but 
Um, so I think it is an asset, but it is also a risk that my own kind of worldview can sometimes be imprinted. So to kind of avoid that, yeah, I'll try and lead as much as I can with the people. And I, I think it's that idea of being a self shooter, you're all the technical stuff and you will produce it, but that kind of like editorial guidance, I try and outsource to everyone in front of the camera. You know, like for example, the project I showed you at the start was filming with young people and they have these amazing um, insights to the natural world. And I try to keep that as unedited and unfiltered as possible and just, you know, not create a film that was too, you know, I think it's just very sensitive editing, but it's something I'm still learning, but a lot of the time scripts will come from the client or the organization. So that makes things a bit easier. But then music, I add music that adds an emotional tone. Um, so, but that's why I think I try and most of my work comes from sustainability and climate change. Whilst we need a diverse response to that, which I can authentically deliver completely myself, it is a topic that I think I have a bit more insight to, which makes me more confident in my business being able to do that. But um, I am now trying to branch out and to figure out what other things I can give an authentic voice to within my own life and, and things. So, yeah. But it's, it's a question I come back to a lot and I don't, again, I don't think I'll ever have an answer. It's coherent. <laughs> Well, it's all a journey, but it's very interesting to hear your insights um, along the journey. So with the music, as you say, and adding the emotive sort of um, uh, tonality to the film, um, I, it feels like this is why we, you were, it feels like that like film is a crucial part of getting people on board with sustainability and with just because there is a like film has that power to create that emotional connection that in the end makes you act like you know we're emotional human beings and if you can you know if you can manage to reach someone on that level um and to touch someone on that level that will make an impact on them enough to move them into action um and that's really what it's all about moving you know on a massive scale people to action and again this is why film is so good because um it reaches you know it has the potential to reach you know worldwide so um i love that you connected that to a moment of an adele's uh, adele song because she really does have that like emotional power <laughs> um but i felt like i was going somewhere with that sorry i lost my plot yeah um there's with the film like obviously with filmmaking there's the outward and what's on camera but there's also what's behind the camera and how you actually put the project together and i know when we you know chatted to prepare this talk you were mentioning about the other part of what you do which is um, sort of sustainability on the production level, making sure that you know um, the carbon footprint of a production is as small as possible. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and how, like, how that came about and how you do that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think my own kind of work, they both both media work and sustainability work stem from the same kind of feeling of like I, I was when I was younger. I kind of felt I, I was really interested in nature and stuff, and that led me into climate change and environmental change and stuff which both kind of started two prongs I, I got into kind of sustainability because I want to communicate this stuff but that also led me to kind of really um, learn and build kind of an awareness of the professional side and how to work on that but I was also communicating it along the same side so there's always been two strands of the work both have kind of gone in tandem so yeah the other side comes from I work for a university currently part-time to um, support their movements to more sustainable operations so it's interesting to take things from that. So now doing film work, it's it can seem quite light because I um, travel mainly within Glasgow and if it's a further afield, I'll take public transport. I just have all the camera gear on my back. So I think, oh, what could I be doing? But that's so wrong because the digital footprint of a lot of this stuff, both from the electricity and power that goes into all the server forms that your data is stored on, you know, the, I'm so, I'm a very paranoid person. So I back up as much as possible in a very unorganized way, just throwing things to the cloud. So that's dangerous for climate change. And then also when you look at things like cameras and microphones and all these different pieces of equipment, what is the production line of that? Because there's some really, you know, um, particular elements that go into these things. So what is that? And it's something that I'm trying to explore as we go. Um, and it's something that I, again, I, I don't think the answer I give you now will be the same answer I'd give you in 10 years time. Hopefully the development the future will be much more eloquent. But I think it's just, yeah, it's looking at the kind of power usage, which is huge, um, but every single step of the way. And it, particularly when you outsource, because as a kind of filmmaker, you're calling the shots of the production, whatever client you're working with. Yeah, sure. Or production company or broadcaster or whatever it is. There's a lot of... Um, 
Dale sets things up to an extent, but you're hired because you can call the shots. So when it comes to that, from organizing travel to um, if you have a big enough project, you know, then it's things like catering. Um, there's a lot of um, outsourcing that you do. And I think it's every time something's outsourced, you're thinking, right, how can we get the most sustainable thing possible here? But it's also getting right to the core of your own operations. So right now, one of the things that I'm looking into is trying to take stuff off of cloud servers and into um, external hard drives and hard copies of things, which is scary for me because I like I like thinking these nice server farms are keeping my data safe. So I mean, it's a trade-off and it's compromises, but it's this that thing of, you know, we are all working as independents. And if you're doing freelance stuff, you're one person, like it's a systemic problem. If we want to solve this, it comes from a huge systemic change in the way we work. And we have, sure, pur purchasing power with consumers, but at the same time, this needs to come from higher up. You can't put all the pressure on an individual. So I think hopefully it's as we get more senior in our careers, we can just start open relationships with the manufacturers and things and try and, you know, work with them and, and do what we can, but also hope that they are the ones having these conversations too. So yeah, I think it is just trying to be as aware as possible. Um, but then another side of that is, is anti-greenwashing, which I think is working with clients. I've been really fortunate. All the clients I've worked with to date have been as, or if not more aware of that than I come into it with. And I don't even have to mention greenwashing before they're like, right, you can't be much this we need to be honest which is amazing but i think a lot of the stories I, I kind of work with is like how an organization is responding to the climate crisis which can be really beautiful and powerful but also without any negative intent you could it's an easy trap you could fall into but suddenly just be you know patting an organization on the back that you're working for without getting into that so what i'm trying to develop this kind of risk averse way to greenwashing with, with clients and myself so that if someone works with me, they can rest assured that I'm doing everything I can to not greenwash. And it means that as a production company, we can do that. Anyone, you know, because storytelling is a huge thing. That means that as a production industry, we are kind of not controlling the stories that are being told because that would be a, a whole new problem. But we have a certain filter to just try to, to challenge our clients as much as possible to be telling stories as positively um, and well, maybe not positively as honestly as we can. Um, I mean, so many, yeah, again, so many points to um, explain. Sorry, I'm really going no, out of it. No, that's here. <laughs> um, I guess the first thing is, um, so for anyone who's listening, who's new or, you know, to, and wants to get involved with like, you know, the world movement on COP26 and everything, but what is greenwashing? Like, how do you, how do you describe it? How do you define it? Uh, I think, I think it's just, well, there's two, I was thinking that this morning, actually. Um, over my breakfast, I was having a very greenwashy um, thought. And I was thinking there's two sides of it. You get some organizations who are trying to cover up bad things they're doing by creating these kind of like um, red herrings, these kind of scapegoats of like, oh, but look at all this amazing stuff we're doing, you know, which is, um, I think you can see a lot in terms of um, fossil fuel companies and things, energy companies who, sure, they're doing some great stuff with the re renewables and nothing will, looking at those different things alone doesn't discredit anything, but there's still a lot of negative work that's going on. So it's kind of like just kind of diverting attention away. But I think it's also something of like an organization that just the only comms that's put out is patting yourself on the back. So we have got this amazing net zero target. We've got, we're doing this amazing work on climate change. We've reduced emissions by this much. Great. But it's when an organization is only telling really positive stories. I think you miss the opportunity that communications and media has to bring up some of those complexities, you know, the need for just transitions um, and the elements of climate justice within everything. So greenwashing to me is um, giving maybe too much of percent of the story to the positive success stories of an organization without an awareness of the more complex problems that are, um, are present or just completely lying and pretending you're doing better than you are, which is, I suppose, also a big problem. And how do you, that's really interesting because like, as you said about, you know, the financial side of things and how you make money in this industry, it's working for clients or pitching submissions, independent submissions to broad broadcaster. So effectively, when you work for a client, it's, it's branded content. So you kind of tell the stories they want you to tell. How do you negotiate, you know, telling the truth in that, in that context? Is that I mean, something you've ever come across? Or? Uh, absolutely. And it's something that it causes anxiety and distress. And <laughs> like, because <laughs> you, you have to look at what you're doing between, am I going to, you know, get um, enough money to, you know, keep this a sustainable career this month? Um, and I think you've got to be, if there's trade-offs there, like you've got to stand up for these things. But at the same time, if you're a business that's working in this, and you know your attitude in this is 
probably quite radical and or you're trying to be as radical as you can be then if you get put out of business that doesn't support anyone and i think that what i my approach now and i i say i've been fortunate to work with a lot of organizations that are very clued up on this which is probably part of why i'm now thinking about this so much but um yeah i one of the i had a, a big rant about greenwashing with one of the previous kind of organizations that i produced a film with the other day so i feel like they're educating me a lot um but i think what i'm keen to do now is to create a little document of like a kind of a greenwashing risk assessment or some kind of um like pledge i don't know what it would be like that sounds some kind of thing just when i give a client a contract i can say this is my this is the way i work and and like this is this kind of story i'll tell about stopping greenwashing so that I kind of commit that as a business, I won't allow this kind of greenwashing to happen. And if I can give them that document, then they can then agree to that. And that becomes part of like a signed contract. So that means that, I don't know, this is all just like me thinking okay. about, I need to get a legal perspective on this, but hopefully if we can bring it into a signed contract, that means if something comes up, I can say, no, I can't, we can't do this, but it is difficult, you know, and it, a lot of the companies you work with, the ones that are unfortunately the more likely to greenwash probably have more legal clout behind them. So it could just say, nah, your contract's done, mate. If you're not going to work with us, you're being a difficult. So it's a, I don't know. And I think that it's something that is, it's really difficult because, you know, I've heard of musicians doing this in the sense that they'll have a sustainability rider. So they're, if they're going to play a gig, um, they will say to the, I know writers usually sound really kind of, I remember when I was at uni, who is it like a big musician came and they were like, well, I need a suit given to me or whatever. So hopefully this is a better um, way to do writers. But yeah, so essentially every time a musician goes to a venue, they say, right, this is our writer. You know, for some, or for some musicians, that's like, we need completely vegan food provided mm. or whatever. But there's some that say we need to, you need to do a certain low emissions um, logistics behind the gigs. So I don't know, which is, I think, really powerful. So how can I do the same thing for film? I don't know. But we will all come up to a time when we're working for an organization who are just like, right, you need to do this for us. And then I think it's just a judgment call. It's literally how much money is in the bank. It, you know, if I don't get this job, how, how reliant am I on the money? And then you've got to make a call and it's horrible. And it's when you're just working alone, those are really, really upsetting moments. But I don't think it would be realistic for me to say to anyone, yeah, you've just got to completely stick to your gut and, and to say no, because that's a financial thing that a lot of us don't have the luxury to do. And if we have, if we have the financial backing to say any client that says that and just turn away from a client and say, I'm not working for you anymore, then amazing. That's you're in a great place and that's wonderful. But I think there's a reality of that. We're all still trying to put, you know, pay our rents, get um, food on the table. And it's to a judgment call for everyone. I think it's a horrible situation to be in, but yeah. But thank you. I mean, what amazing insights. And also the fact, like the tools that you're giving yourself, like, um, you know, naming your terms effectively. That's really interesting to know. Um, but that- I'll let you know how it goes. It speaks to me a few months and I'll we'll see how it's gone. <laughs> so that's a copy. <laughs> yeah. the, um, but that, that dynamic between the money and, um, uh, you know, the, the principles. I mean, that's something that even, you know, I'm guessing all the fuel companies are, it's always, you know, it's always the struggle between the money and the... Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think if you... There's a certain amount of responsibility, I think, that comes if you're dealing with a certain amount of money and, like, wealth and, and all that. You, oh, no, you I kind of have that. But I think it's difficult because, you know, it is, it's hard because I think one of the things that we spoke about when we were talking about this was, like, I hear a lot of people talk about film, which is an amazing way. I see these production companies that kind of spring up, and it's amazing, but I don't necessarily know the financial story which is not my business at all but I think as someone getting into this it's really hard when you don't know how these people financially come to be um and when I think to make it accessible we need to talk about money but I just think that would be a real kind of like well I say privilege I'm still starting up as a business and I don't quite add a lot you know I don't quite have that financial backing myself but I, I think we need to be careful because if we don't talk about money and we just kind of pretend that all of us here and we these are our principles full stop we could actually push a lot of people out of the industry that have the best ideas. If I was to say, yeah, if an organization does that walk away, don't, you know, don't, mm -hmm. I mean, there will be some things that like stories that you just simply can't tell. And I, I am probably talking here about the much more um, blurred lines kind of stuff of like uncertainty, you know, if it's like a big fossil fuel company, well, I don't know, that's a, well, I don't know, it's hard to explain. If it's something completely immoral, then, you know, I think we all have a very easy time of being like, nah, pal, you're all right, I'm off. But it is those blurred lines, those uncertainties. And, and what, what's your threshold for feeling uncomfortable about the story that's being told? Obviously, you could shape it in a way, but if that's pushed back from the client, 
you know, I, I think it would be really dangerous to the industry to say you've always got to walk away because people might take that advice and then find themselves in a position. So, yeah, that financial narrative is something that I think we just need to keep talking about it and, and have a support network for people that if that happens, hopefully they've got someone they can call, a discussion they can have um, to come to a decision or know when to trade off. I don't know. It's tricky. It's really tricky. But I love that you are holding space for talking about it. So thank you so much for that. Um, I wanted to come back to uh, the work that you showed us with the children. Um, because, you know, the, the accent is really put, I feel, on this COP26 with like young voices, new voices, you know, and I mean, they are, like, I, I guess it's um, the idea is to sort of educate the next generation that, of, you know, of, of consumers to uh, be able to, well, sustain the planet effectively. <laughs> like, um, and is that something that you see like more of, like working with children? And that's the first part of the question. And the second part is, I saw that you interviewed Greta Thunberg as well. And she looked quite young in the, she always looks young, but she looks quite young on the, on the video. So I wanted to know about your experience with that as well. Yeah, well, that was wild. Um, so yeah, sadly, I'm not sure coming to Glasgow, she would have any memory of me or would recognize me if she bumped into me as, as gutted as I am about that. But yeah, no, she is an amazing activist and um, doing brilliant work. And especially if you can follow the stuff she's doing now, she's, you know, she's someone that is, you know, unlike me in my narrative, absolutely fearless and willing to call people out, you know, full stop, which I think just deserves the, the biggest respect. And you know, I think her and all of the different activists um, and the diverse range of activists doing what she's doing is incredible. Um, so yeah, I think young people, I mean, I say working with young people is great. I don't think young people necessarily need me as much as you might think, because there's some amazing stuff. There's, um, if you heard, uh, there's a new series come, um, Climate Change According to Kids, has come out and it's these kind of young people in schools have produced amazing stop motion um, animations which is just fantastic and it looks like something a professional production company could do so I think the media skills that the younger generations are bringing to the table now are incredible you know I think because now I think in school you'll learn the very basic principles or kind of like fundamentals of coding in p1 or you know very simplistically put so when you've got young people coming out of school you know they don't need necessarily the professional production company but I think from my perspective I still like to think I am a young person I work in that sector of like young people's advocacy groups so I don't know at what moment I will wake up and realize that the young part of my identity is now has now left me behind I'm still hanging on to it but yeah um but yeah I think it's it's crucial I mean it's, it goes without saying it's the next generation we don't get young people on board then who's who are we working for and they are I think have the most progressive ideas so it's crucial and those young people that we worked with in that film there they come up with the best best kind of possible ways to discuss nature and it's funny because I think climate change it can become so over um intellectualized over academicized if that's a word obviously oh. I'm not from the academic sector because I would not be um using words like that if I was but yeah it becomes very elite sometimes in the knowledge um but I think it's like you know but the science and everything which is crucial we need the science for climate change absolutely but I think when you see young people talking about the connection to nature it's you realize wait a minute the, the connection that human beings have to nature is not something we need science to understand it's something that we all have within us and I think young people just have the deepest connection to that part or like their soul or whatever um I think as you get older it, it, there's a lot of complexity that goes on in your mind and it maybe makes it harder to connect with different parts of your um or maybe makes it harder to connect with different parts of the world around you um as the stress of career and life kind of build up but these young people were incredible and I think they can just so eloquently put the importance of nature on things which was really beautiful to work with um so yeah that, that, that I think is why it's great to get their voices heard and they're also just great in front of the camera you know the amount of time I work film myself and film with adults and we're like take three four five six these these people were just boom done and I was it, honestly like some of the most professional work I felt I was doing was, was with especially the narrator you see him there um at the end an absolute star, like so professional, just nailed it at all these times. I had to do different takes because the sound was bad. The, the camera focus was a little bit off. I had to go and change the, the exposure, but he would just like nail it every single time. So, you know, it's, if you want to work with professionals, get just, you know, there's that expression, what don't work with children or animals or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think, yeah, that's, we need to revisit that one. But yeah. <laughs> but then coming to Greta, yeah, it was a huge privilege to do that. It was an organization that I was working with at the time called the Royal Scottish Geographical Society. And they were like, do you want to go and interview Greta in Stockholm? So we thought, great, but we better get there sustainably. So we had to, we took this very long, but really fun um, rail and sea-based 
journey to Stockholm. A lot of late night bus changes and running for, across um, uh, cities in, in Europe and Scandinavia at night. So it was a really fun, yeah, it was great. And I, I really appreciate her for taking that time. And I think she's a voice that's really important and she's she's really triggering people and, and causing a lot of response, which is, you know, it's a difficult one because there's a lot of weird narratives to go around what she says sometimes from the response she gets, but I think she's brilliant. And it was so nice to interview her because she is just this amazing icon for the youth movement on climate change. I mean, if it wasn't for her, where would we be? Her and the movement of all the investment that's been put around her messaging, where would we be? Um, so it was really powerful to get and hit, to hear her talk about Scot Scotland. It sounds silly, but like, you know, asking her questions like, what's your message for the Scottish government and things and like, what should we be doing? And, well, how can Scotland, you know, what's your insight on that? And, and it's really special to, to kind of hear her, in her words, mention our country and, and, and what we could be doing. So, yeah, but I think it's just that connectivity. There's there's no barrier for th that those kind of movements for young people. And it's this very, um, it seems like it's a space where a lot of different voices are allowed, being allowed to be heard. Um, and you've, there's amazing work with her and, well, more, a lot of other youth activists um, around COP um, with an emphasis on the others, there's a huge, amazing movement of people around her. But yeah, that was, I mean, in short, it was just very, very cool to go and work there. <laughs> Thanks, Cameron. I've got one last question for you, and then I'll open it up to uh, you guys if you have any questions. So uh, please let me know. Um, or like, I think you can raise your hand or something, but um, yeah. So my last question for you is, do you, like, obviously with lockdown and the last, like, 18 months where... You know, we heard lots of beautiful stories and it's everything else of because like, you know, no more air travel, no more, you know, um, uh, boats on the sea and all of that. So you could see, you know, what was it? The dolphins in Italy and yeah. you know, just nature coming back to life and, you know, in ways that probably in our lifetime we've never seen. Um, and also, you know, with the one hour exercising outdoors a day and everything, like I feel like people, A, I feel like people rediscovered nature because that's really the most like immediate thing we had access to and needed for our mental health and also um people rediscovered scotland as a beautiful country and you know oh my god look at what we have on our doorstep um so do you see like as we emerge from lockdown in the projects that you've been offered or that you pitch for do you see a difference in the way people approach nature yeah i mean i think it's fascinating that like lockdown coincided with the build-up to cop 26 because it was announced I think four months or so well I announced that Glasgow was in the running four months or so before lockdown which was just like this super exciting thing and then yeah so it was wild and I remember like I think the week before lockdown I was at this huge cop meeting and we were all ready to go and then it didn't happen so I think yeah I want to I think your question is so lovely but I do want to just bring that cop narrative into it as well because I think I don't know how to separate the two so the limitations of how I can answer that I think I need to kind of reference cop but yeah I think I mean lockdown it's been difficult and not to it, I mean, especially for creatives, it's been not maybe a it's been not been a positive time at all. It's been, it's been awful, but I, I don't want to discredit the the struggles. But I think that there is this moment of of being forced to kind of spend time in nature and whatever you've there. I think we've all had moments of, you know, maybe it's just kind of going to nature to just kind of you know detox and reconcile the stress of the situation that's going on. And I think nature is um, a really beautiful way to do that. There's a book I'm reading just now called. Um, thin places um and it's all about nature and the otherworldliness of nature um as this nature is this kind of like portal to other worlds as being this incredible escapism from whatever um stress is going on in your life um and i think that's a really good reference to lockdown i think for a lot of people going for these walks in nature getting out of the house and it, it was that and i think that's it's for me i can only talk to myself and the people around me but it, it, i did really find that you know i was going up the Calvin River and found like places like Dawson Park. I'm sure if you've lived in Glasgow, you know, you'll know that more than I did, but it was this amazing parts of town. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was really cool. But yeah, I think it is interesting now coming out there. I think there's more, it's hard to tell what's locked out of what's the legacy of COP. I, there's a lot of carbon net zero stuff that's coming out now. That's very COP. I'm hoping, I mean, it'll be the next month or so will be really interesting once COP goes what appetite is there for commissions and, and, and contracts and stuff. But I think it, it's difficult because there's so much going on just now about connecting with the natural world. And I think in Scotland, there's a lot of amazing pieces of music and artists and stuff that are creating work and more prolifically now more than ever. There was a lot of stuff produced in lockdown when the only kind of 
place you could go was into your local park. So I think that led to a lot of, a lot of stuff, but I, I'd love to revisit that question. As I say, literally in just even just a month, post cut next week even just to, to see cops gone what is the appetite but I think I'm definitely pitching a lot of more of this stuff because my my theory if you'll have my kind of just pure brain dump of thought is that cop now has happened all this talk on net zero carbon reductions and these technical solutions is there partly I think we're tired of that but partly I think we're realizing that that's not quite the full story and obviously alongside that there's a huge climate justice thing of like you know um decolonizing and all that which I think will come too but I think one of the other strands that will come, particularly with this kind of post-lockdown thing, is that we need to connect more with nature. There's a quote, um, this uh, a queer environmentalist and drag queen, Patagonia, has this great quote that I will butcher, but I can't put more eloquently. And they say, um, you, and we need to, to, to pr protect nature, we need to connect with it because we fight, we need to connect with nature to love nature because we fight for what we love. Terrible rendition of that quote that's not it at all but essentially if we have a connection with nature we can protect it and fight for it and I think that attitude is something that's really come out of lockdown and cop sorry a very long-winded answer but hopefully that's answered your question in some in some way absolutely and it goes back to you know filmmaking and the emotional connection that you can create for people as well 100%. So that's a beautiful loop thank you so much Cameron thank so you interesting um you guys is there any questions that you have for Cameron um just unmute yourself and speak now or forever hold your peace anyone no okay well i mean is there any good question i haven't asked you cameron is there anything that you want I, to talk about that I your questions asked? have been great i don't think so um i think no i'm just excited and i think for me like i am very new to this world i don't necessarily have a huge network of the filmmakers behind me so I hope that as we all go forward soon this kind of work we can all work together I think that's such a nice thing like Absolutely. um and hopefully we can be in touch we'll we'll run into each other um in the the train of the chain of contracts and subcontracts <laughs> at some point I'm sure um but yeah I I think it's an exciting time and I'm just buzzing to kind of connect with more people in this industry and yeah challenge the sustainability narrative but yeah um I oh we have a we do have a question yeah. there we go um, Fred is asking, in terms of funding or pitching your ideas for broadcast or elsewhere, where do you look for these opportunities? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> it's what I ask myself a lot. Um, <laughs> I think in terms of looking for opportunities, I think it depends what stage you're at. I am, I suppose, at the very cusp of feeling confident enough to pitch to an actual broadcast channel. I've, well, I've made pitches before and they've not gone ahead, but I've had really positive responses in terms of feedback. I would say I'll start at the top of what I know and then move down to stuff on a, a smaller audience level that I think I could talk better about the top level for kind of like you know um broadcasters like you know if stuff on tv I'd say there's great commissioning briefs on their website so if you go to kind of any commissioning department of BBC ITV etc you will find what they're looking for you know we're looking for a a one-off documentary on whatever and, and look at BBC Scotland um there's some brilliant documentaries that have come out that have been produced by re really self by self shooters, you know, if um, I, I'm struggling at the moment to remember the names, I don't want to get the names wrong, but um, there's some brilliant stuff, especially BBC Alaba as well. It, it, um, I've been working with them a little bit recently, um, and it's a brilliant, they're, they're so open and they don't need some huge production company, Netflix level production. Um, they really understand the fact that audiences now want to connect with people on that personal level. So I would say, yeah, where do you look for these opportunities? I would say, look on the commissioning pages of these channels but also look at the kind of not necessarily broadcast the digital opportunities. So for example, ABC, the social is a platform that for me, um, I, I was not, I gave it some terrible pitches before they finally sat down to talk to me. Um, so I would say things like that are great if, you know, to get in the door and to just get out. So that's the digital con producing digital content for the broadcasters, social media channels. Um, and the opportunities come from whatever you think the niche is, but also they will be giving that on the commissioning pages of the websites, um, going down, um, the uh i would say you look for clients and it's about like you know thinking what kind of stories you can tell and want to tell look for the organizations who you think if you find an organization you think god then they're, they're totally missing the mark here they're not doing a great job they could be doing so much better we don't say it like that but can i connect with them start conversations and plant seeds like i had a job just before lockdown just before lockdown just for a cop see my brain's mixed now just before cop but i think i sent the first email just cold emailing being like hey do you want to work together 
before lockdown. So over a year before, and then that came back. So you've got to play, play the long game with these things. Um, pitching ideas, broadcasts elsewhere in terms of funding. Yeah, funding, I think I there's a lot of funding going around. And I think it's just about being a bit enterprising and entrepreneurial. Um, Creative Scotland's the big one. Um, it depends what kind of team. If you've got a kind of team of like, you know, you, you can get a bit of a professional look, then Creative Scotland's 100%. But yeah, there's always pots of money. As I say, like the first thing I ever did was funded by the Mackay Clan Society, which is kind of wild because of my, just by virtue of the fact my surname happens to be Mackay. But for me, they were the kind of gateway because they gave me money towards the camera, which allowed me to make that first piece than the first thing I did. So there's a little bit of money everywhere, probably you're working to a higher level than that. But yeah, it's difficult. I think it's, there's no right answer. There's no single way to do it. I, I, I feel I should be getting some much more poignant answer than this, but I'd say, yeah, look at what you're doing. Look at the thing about the audience that the stuff that you want to tell is. And I say, lead, yeah, lead with your own ideas, figure out what audience that might appreciate the stories that you want to tell. And then, yeah, think about, about that. I think the big thing is access. If you, as long as you've got a character or access to a community or something, then people want that. And I think a lot of broadcasters will see access maybe more before they see the people filming. I don't know. Um, I won't ramble on to speak on things that I don't know how to speak about. I hope that answers your question. And um, that's literally just my own perspective. I can't speak to the industry, but I can speak to my own experience. So, yeah. No, and I think that's, again, amazing. It's as much sort of going out as sort of receiving. And I love the long game thing because that's also oh, yeah. experience. You just plant seeds and it will come back to you in ways that you'd never imagine. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's like, uh, it's an expression, I know it's kind of bad to say, but like, um, I heard this when I was doing like, you know, this expedition I used to do before. It was um, this kind of like, uh, yeah, it, it's a bit of advice, it's like under promise and over deliver. I know that sounds like a lot when you're like trying not to overcommit yourself, but like, I think that's what, I think if you get a client that's good, I might write, how do I kind of do that? So, you know, um, one of my clients, for example, I sampled part of their, uh, we were doing a piece and they have like an exhibit, it was at Science Centre and I was like sampled some of their music part for this exhibit, it made a noise as you stood on it and then I sampled it and made a tune and then I sent them all that music, which wasn't in the contract, but hopefully things like that can, I love doing that because it builds a relationship. Yeah, that's what I say, build relationships, which is why I did that. And it's playing a long game because like, yeah, but also do stuff that you care about, like find the little bits of the work that you're doing that you really love doing. That's what I like doing. And then just sharing that a bit over the top of what you would usually do. Um, but then, yeah, I think it's just, yeah, build relationships. I think, and I don't know why I didn't say that at the first. That's where opportunities I think have come from for me. And, and, and that Children's Woodland piece, I have been on the committee for that project for like, again, a year. Um, and then because I've done a lot of work for them along the way, um, because yeah, I did work for free and, and I, that for me was a way that I could build these relationships. That's not an accessible point for everyone. Um, but yeah, hopefully that's, yeah. So I want to read the response there. Um, it's great to see that it's not only the big multinational companies that can reach out to broadcasters to pitch ideas. Oh, hundred percent. And I think accessibility now they want, they, they, I think that they're, in, they're realizing across the board and not just broadcasters, all channels that we don't just want a very polished, you know, high level production company thing. I mean, if that's where you're working, like, that's great, you know, but I think people want um, accessibility and to put kind of diversity and inclusivity, oh, that's such buzzwords that maybe would almost um, divert attention away from the, the meaning of them, but stories that are unheard and people, voices that might not have been heard, if that's what you can lead with, you know, I think that's maybe a really good way to go, but accessibility for everyone, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think it's finding the part of your own story that is maybe a bit more niche. You know, for example, there's a few ideas that I'm trying to build treatments for that are about queerness and the, the queerness within the environmental sector and, and things that for me is a, an authentic part of what I can tell, but also the stories that I don't think have been heard a huge amount. So I think if you can tap into that, then not only is that something people are going to want to hear, but it's something that I think could be really powerful, connect with audiences and make a difference in an audience sector that you work with. Absolutely. And... Um... Just for me, what it always comes back to, and what I think you're in body, Cameron, is authenticity. So, you know, as a filmmaker, you just go back to who you are and the stories you want to tell, which is amazing. Well, thank you, Fred, for the question. And if that is it, then we're about just on time, which is amazing. Cameron, thank you so, so much for being here today. And I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about and from you. In the <laughs> no, that 
good luck with post COP twenty six time. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, hopefully we can have we put our feet off, relax for a bit. But no, um, thank you so much. It's been so nice to chat to you, Bernine, and, and everyone. I've really enjoyed the conversation. And I, as you said, I can't wait to see all the work that you guys are doing. Um, I've seen some links to the kind of um, the college and what you do, and I think it's amazing. So yeah, I'll be definitely keeping in touch and following all the amazing stuff you're doing. So thank you so much. And yeah, I hope you enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you so much. You too. Have a good Tuesday, everyone. See you a bit later, hopefully at the hub. Bye. Bye. Cheers.